Hey, welcome back. Today we're looking at Measure for Measure, one of Shakespeare's frustratingly fantastic problem plays. I'd like to do a separate video about all the problem plays together sometime, but in short, the problem plays are plays that bend the genre beyond what it can bear. In Measure for Measure, it is supposed to be a comedy, but by the end we're feeling pretty disturbed. And the outcome ends with the usual marriage and uh, the usual resolution for the characters, a return to a happy state. There's a lot that makes us very uncomfortable with this ending. Noticeably that the tensions created in the play cannot be happily resolved in a marriage, and we're left very unsatisfied with the general justice of the piece, even though everything has been theoretically set to right. Let's start with the title. The title, Measure for Measure, is a line that a main character is going to say very near the end of the play. And it's also a reference to a passage in the Bible where Jesus is talking about those who mete out justice for others had better be careful because they had better walk the straight and narrow themselves. If you're going to be harsh as a judge, you should look carefully at your own life. The measure you used will be measured against you. With that said, I'm going to go ahead and give a warning here. This play is about some pretty uncomfortable topics, and definitely not one to share with young children. I would even go so far as to say that this is perhaps the most uncomfortable of Shakespeare's plays, even more so than the cannibalistic bloodbath at the end of Titus Andronicus. That's just straight up slasher horror, but this is even creepier. Because this is about people who abuse power to feed their own appetites. It is both horrifying and strikingly real. So let's look at the major action of the play. The play opens with the Duke of Vienna choosing to go on vacation. Why he does so is not immediately clear, although we get hints as the story goes along. In short, he doesn't want to do his job right now, and so he puts a deputy in his place to be his person while he's away. He gives this job to a man named Angelo, and again, his choice is interesting. He passes over a very good official named Aeschylus, who has more experience and would be a better substitute. And although at first it seems like Angelo is a good choice because, after all, he's got Angel in his name, he is a person who always does what is right and never, ever would step out of line. At least that's the impression we get of him early on. And yet as the story goes on, he becomes much more complicated and complex. But even that first impression is corrected later on, not only by his actions, but also by the Duke's assessment of him. Angelo has a history himself. A history not of rampant wrongdoing, exactly, but a history of not being a particularly nice or merciful person. It's almost as though the Duke is setting him up in some ways. He puts him in position quickly, doesn't really explain everything, and then scuttles off without any fanfare. When Angelo and Aeschylus try to at least walk him out of the city, he says, no, 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 and he dashes away. This is to some extent clarified in scene three, when the Duke explains to a friar that he didn't like the way the city was being run, which You'd think if you're in charge of the city and you don't like the way it's being run, why don't you change it? The problem is that there are lots of rules on the books which are very, very harsh. And the Duke has been really lenient about all of them. And his leniency has led to the spread of vice and bad behavior. Hmm. So if you shoot your law and justice in the foot, you ultimately lead to more crime. What's the solution for it? Well, he could crack down, but he doesn't want to be the one who plays harsh. So instead he decides to step out of town. After all, he doesn't really like ruling anyway. And put somebody else in charge, somebody who has a reputation for being kind of hard-nosed. Somebody who will exact the letter of the law. That's Angelo. And so with Angelo doing his dirty work of cracking down on evil for him, the city can get straightened out and then he can go back to a comfortably run city. Doesn't make you love the Duke, does it? In any case, how is the town? Well, it's a mess. The rampant crime is particularly in the category of licentiousness. Prostitution, fornication, trafficking in human flesh. These are the problems of Vienna. Sexually transmitted diseases are running rampant, brothels are thriving, and the overall tone is heavy lust coupled with heavy guilt. Everybody feels kind of gross about everything. 
there's no delight in any of the sexual pleasures being offered up. And that's true of the whole book. Everybody is doing what they want and feeling really bad about it. We introduce in scene two a man named Lucio, who's a gentleman who is fast, loose, and crass. He's a slick talker who enjoys a good dirty joke. And in this scene, we discover that Angelo is already cracking down on the city of Vienna. He's doing so by arresting the first person he can catch, which happens to be a man named Claudio. Now, what did Claudio do wrong? Well, he committed fornication. That is, he slept with his fiance. They had already had a unofficial marriage, but had kept it a secret because not all of her dowry was in order yet. They were planning on doing the official marriage afterwards and then settling down to be happily married, but she became pregnant before they could go through the official channels. Now, of all the crime in Vienna and all of the rather dirty behavior going on in the background, this one is definitely the most excusable. And somehow in the books, there's a law that says that anyone commits fornication will be killed. No wonder the Duke didn't want to hold people accountable. The law is really extreme here. It's true that sometimes crazy laws get on the books and people ignore them. For example, apparently there is a law in Iowa that says mustaches are illegal if the bearer has a tendency to habitually kiss other humans. Hmm. In Pennsylvania, it is apparently illegal to sleep on top of a refrigerator outdoors. In Oklahoma, it is illegal to have the hind legs of farm animals in your boots. So yeah, sometimes weird laws get in place. But Angelo is now cracking down on this particular law. And although Claudio fully intends to marry Juliet, now he's going to be executed before he can do so. We also hear that all the houses of prostitution are being torn down in the suburbs, but not the ones in the city. A character named Pompey, who is a tapster and also a bawd, explains, they shall stand for seed. They had gone down too, but a wise burger put in for them. Claudio is being dragged through the city to proclaim his crime, sort of Scarlet Letter-esque, and he sees Lucio and calls out to him and asks Lucio to go get his sister. Maybe his sister can plead for him and get him off. His sister, it just so happens, is a nun, or about to become a nun. Her name is Isabella. We'll see how that goes. In scene three, as we mentioned, the Duke is talking with a friar, but one other detail that's important. The Duke decides not to leave Vienna. He's not really going on vacation, he just kind of wanna, wants to watch everything from the sidelines. And so he's going to disguise himself as a friar, and so he can move around the city at his leisure without attracting any attention. He kind of hates being Duke, in fact. It's too much work, too many people paying attention to you. Bringing us to scene four, where Lucio comes to find Isabella just about to formally enter the convent and become a nun. We see from a snatch of her conversation before Lucio enters that she's very, very pious, so much so that she even would like the nuns to be stricter than they already are. But then Lucio comes in and she speaks with him. She finds out what's happening with her brother. And Lucio, who is always full of dirty jokes, keeps cracking them around her. When Isabella finds out that Juliet is pregnant, she says, well, why doesn't Claudio just marry her? But then Lucio explains about the deputy who stepped into the place of the Duke. So Isabella agrees to leave the nunnery for now and go and plead for her brother. Act two. The first scene begins with a conversation between Aeschylus and Angelo, the two who've been left by the Duke. And Aeschylus is trying to get Angelo to be more lenient with Claudio. But Angelo must follow the law. Tis one thing to be tempted, Aeschylus, another thing to fall. I not deny the jury passing on the prisoner's life may, in the sworn twelve, have a thief or two guiltier than him they try. What's open made to justice, that justice seizes. What knows the laws that thieves do pass on thieves, tis very pregnant. The jewel that we find we stoop and take because we see it. But what we do not see we tread upon and never think of it. You may not so extenuate his offense, for I have had such faults, but rather tell me, when I that censure him do so offend, let mine own judgment pattern out my death, and nothing come impartial. Sir, 
he must die. So yes, sometimes there are people who get away with their crimes, but we're not talking about them. We're talking about this guy named Claudio who has been caught and we know he committed the crime, therefore, justice says he must die. It doesn't matter if every once in a while I looked with lust. It's not about what's inside of me, it's about what I can prove. While they're sitting there meeting out justice, up comes Officer Elbow, who, as you expect, is one of those comic relief characters. He's full of malapropisms, saying all the wrong words. And he has in his keeping Froth and Pompey. Now, we've met Pompey already. Pompey is the tapster bod. And Officer Elbow, who is a terrible communicator, as some of Shakespeare's comic characters are, begins to try to tell the story of what happened between his wife and Pompey. We actually never get the point of the story because he keeps looping around and around and getting more and more confused. And Pompey keeps adding details that th make things even more confusing. The short of it is that apparently Officer Elbow's wife went into this particular house because she wanted some prunes, which have some sexual overtones. The story goes on, in fact, so long that Angelo finally gives up in disgust, saying, this will last out a night in Russia when nights are longest there. And so he leaves and leaves Aeschylus to try to figure out what's going on. Which, again, Aeschylus never really does, but ultimately he lets Pompey off with a warning and looks for Elbow a little bit more help. Scene two of Act Two begins with the Provost going to Angelo and asking if he is sure he wants to kill Claudio, because that seems awfully extreme and awfully fast. But Angelo says, of course I'm sure. At that moment, in comes Isabella, who is ready to plead for her brother's life. Lucio is her backup, whatever good that is. And Isabella doesn't plead for his innocence because she knows he's guilty. And she also, as a person who truly walks a very narrow path, does not like his behavior in this. But she pleads for mercy because mercy is a valuable thing to show. Angelo refuses and Isabella is about to give up, but Lucio keeps pushing her. I do think that you might pardon him, and neither heaven nor man grieve at the mercy. A moment later, well, believe this, no ceremony that to great one longs, not the king's crown, nor the deputy's sword, the marshal's truncheon, nor the judge's robe, become them with one half so good a grace as mercy does. If he had been as you, and you as he, you would have slipped like him but he, like you, would not have been so stern. She continues to plead and plead with him, pointing out how common this is and how few people have died. Why is it coming down upon just her brother? So you must be the first that gives this sentence and he that suffers. Oh, it is excellent to have a giant's strength, but it is tyrannous to use it like a giant. That is one of the most profound lines in the whole play and one well worth digesting. It is excellent to have a giant strength, but it is tyrannous to use it like a giant. How frequently do people in power lord it over others, crushing them simply because they have the power to do so? Her arguments eventually wear away on Angelo until he dismisses her, and when, instead of giving her an answer, says, come back tomorrow, I'll give you my answer then. And she goes so far as to bribe him, which seems almost as though it will lose his interest in the, the conversation, but her bribe is not an earthly bribe, it is a bribe of prayers for heaven. But as she exits, we find that something is going on with Angelo. She leaves saying, save your honor. And he replies to himself, from thee, even from thy virtue. What's this? What's this? Is this her fault or mine? The tempter or the tempted? Who sins most, huh? Not she, nor doth she tempt, but it is I, that lying by the violet in the sun do as the carrion does, not as the flower, corrupt with virtuous season. Can it be that modesty may more betray our sense than woman's lightness? Having waste ground enough, shall we desire to raise the sanctuary and pitch our evils there? Oh, fie, 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 what dost thou, or what art thou, Angelo? Dost thou desire her foully for those things that make her good? Oh, let her brother live. Thieves for their robbery have authority when judges steal themselves. What? Do I love her that I desire to hear her speak again and feast upon her eyes? What is it I dream on? O oh, cunning enemy that, 
to catch a saint, with saints dost bait thy hook. Most dangerous is that temptation that doth goad us on to sin in loving virtue. Never could the strumpet, with all her double vigor, art and nature, once stir my temper. But this virtuous maid subdues me quite. Ever till now, when men were fond, I smiled and wondered how. So he has lost his goodness. In the virtuous and pure Isabella, he has found something to lust for. Now all those strumpets of the streets, all of these houses of sale have never tempted him at all, but in comes this very sweet, very innocent nun, and suddenly, hmm, he's turned something dark on inside of his soul. So here is a man who is supposed to be so good, so pure, so righteous, and now he is lusting after a nun who is pleading for her brother's life, and he holds everything in his power. What happens to people with too much power? In scene three, the Duke of Vienna, in disguise as a friar, goes to the prison and finds out the story of Claudio. And there he meets Juliet, who um, is feeling very guilty for her crime of sleeping with her fiance. And she finds out to her grief that her fiancé is going to die for this crime. But now that the real Duke knows about this, surely he'll do something to stop all of this awful process, right? In scene four, Angelo is waiting to talk to Isabella one more time and to finally have that conversation about what it will cost her to set her brother free. In she comes, and he greets her, and kind of dances around the topic for a moment, saying, well, he might live, but he might not. He might live, but he might not. And then he starts to hint around. He says, then I shall pose you quickly. Which had you rather, that the most just law now took your brother's life, or to redeem him, give up your body to such sweet uncleanness as she, that he hath stained? So would you give up your body for uh, your brother's life? And Isabella doesn't take his meaning directly. She begins to talk about the difference between the body and the soul, the pure inner part of you versus the flesh on the outside. But all really Angelo's interested in is the flesh on the outside. She would be happy to sacrifice herself for her brother, she says, and she also doesn't mind what she would have to do as long as she can live purely. And finally, he hints his way around to the point that, you know, if someone wanted to sleep with you, and if you were to sleep with that person, you would get your brother free. How about that? What would you do? Her response is, as much for my poor brother as myself, that is, were I under the terms of death, the impression of keen whips I'd wear as rubies and strip myself to death, as to a bed that long longing have been sick for, ere I yield my body up to shame. Better it were a brother died at once than that a sister, by redeeming him, should die forever. At this point, she begins to realize how very creepy Angelo has gotten and he begins to exert his power more and more over her. And you can see she's becoming more and more afraid of him as this speech goes on. And he tries to make excuses. You know, women are weak. You should just give in to your weakness. She tries not to believe what he's actually saying at first, and finally when she does, she says, Ha! Little honor to be much believed and most pernicious purpose. Seeming, seeming, I will proclaim thee, Angelo. Look for it. Sign me a present pardon for my brother, or with an outstretched throat I'll tell the world aloud what man thou art. I will tell everyone what you are asking me to do. You better go ahead and sign off my, on my brother's life, or I will tell everyone. And we get the absolute most horrible moment here when Angela looks at her and says, Who will believe thee, Isabel? My unsoiled name. The austereness of my life, my vouch against you, and my place in the state will so your accusation overweigh that you shall stifle in your own report and smell of calumny. I have begun, and now I give my sensual race the rein. Fit thy consent to my sharp appetite, lay all by all nicety and prolixious blushes that banish what they sue for. Redeem thy brother by yielding up thy body to my will. Or else he must not only die the death, but thy unkindness shall his death draw out to lingering sufferance. Answer me tomorrow, or by the affection that now guides me most, I'll prove a tyrant to him. As for you, say what you can. 
my faults or ways your true. It is a terrifying moment when Angelo becomes drunk on power. Isabella is terrified and she says, I will tell everyone on you. And yet, Angelo realizes, no you won't. You can't. I hold all the cards because no one's gonna believe you over me. I have absolute power over you. This play is so horrifying in this moment. Seriously, this is m probably one of the most terrifying speeches in Shakespeare. And what's absolutely horrifying about it is the fact that it is so real. Do people in power abuse that power to glut themselves on pleasure and destroy the innocent all the time? And those who are powerless, those who have no recourse. You can't go to a judge when the judge is corrupt. When you, as the innocent plaintiff, get fed to the dogs, then what are you going to do? When it's the powerless, innocent parties who are called the villains and the terrorists, and then are trampled by the powerful. That is what is truly disgusting. Isabella has nothing. To whom should I complain? Did I tell this who would believe me? Oh, perilous mouths that bear in them one and the self-same tongue, either of condemnation or proof, bidding the law make curtsy to their will, hooking both right and wrong to the appetite, to follow as it draws. All to my brother, though he hath fallen by prompture of the blood, yet hath he in him such a mind of honor, that had he twenty heads to tender down on twenty bloody blocks, He'd yield them up before his sister should her body stoop to such abhorred pollution. Then Isabel live chase, and brother die. More than our brother is our chastity. I'll tell him yet of Angelo's request, and fit his mind to death for his soul's rest. Knowing she has to kill her brother, she has to be the one to let her brother die, because the only other choice for her is giving up something that is she cannot give up. But she knows the honorableness of her brother will ultimately choose her honor rather than his life. Thanks for watching. You can click to subscribe or to watch another video, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.